Hi, Mamas. Hannah here. I'm the founder of Birth Prep Yoga. I've actually taught Sarah. I've known Sarah for years. I'm so excited for her to share her birth story with you because honestly, the more positive birth stories that you can collect and mark and be like, oh, I really like that she did that, the better for yourself. So we're going to get started here with Sarah telling you about how her birth went. She just gave birth a few weeks ago and she said we might near, hear her newborn snoring beside her. Um, but she's going to tell you about her birth and maybe just say, Sarah, your name and where you're, you're located and then uh, you can take it away. Great. Yeah, I'm Sarah Bates. And I live in Wenatchee, Washington, uh, so just south of Hannah, um, across the border. And um, yeah, I'm a single mom by choice. So um, both my little girls are uh, donor conceived and um, they have the same donor dad. And this is Tilly and... Oh, and um, yeah, I just gave birth uh, February 8th and um, Tilly's big sister, Willa, uh, was born right in the middle of COVID uh, in November of 2020. Um, and both girls were born uh, in hospitals. Uh, Willa was born in Seattle and Tilly was born here in Wenatchee. So um yeah, very different birth stories. Uh, the first uh, was definitely affected by COVID a lot. Um, when I started doing uh, Hannah's birth prep yoga, uh, unfortunately, I didn't know about her birth prep yoga for Willa's birth. Um, but I definitely, as as soon as I knew I was pregnant with Tilly, uh, was really super excited to connect with Hannah again um, and get um, and be a part of her birth prep yoga. Um, and I just remember our first uh, like online class, you asked us um, for like a word that we were kind of hoping for, like an affirmation. And I just remember saying like change or like I want a different birth <laughs> than I had with Willa. And like and that's so common, Sarah. Like so many first time moms don't realize how many things are involved in birth. Yeah. And and that it can be really overwhelming. And so that you know that you wanted a better birth for yourself and for your baby. Like people don't realize it's it's not just birth for you. It's for your baby and and her story, right? So you wanted that for her and for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think with Willa's birth, like I really felt like I lacked support. Um, one, because <laughs> the hospital um, policies were at that time, uh, when I went into labor, it was that I could have two support people. And then literally after I got to the hospital, got through triage, everything. They said, oh, our policies are changing at midnight and <sighs> you'll have to ask one of your support people to leave. So I had my mom and my best friend, um, Mary, and I had to like decide um, who I was going to send home at midnight. And it was Terrible. really traumatic to have to make that decision. Um, one, I was um had a lot of back labor uh with Willa and I was in a lot of pain so and I wasn't progressing very quickly so I'd already been in labor for about 20 hours um when I got to the hospital um and then to have to decide to get rid of one of my support people in the midst of that um was really traumatic for me um and so I ended up getting an epidural, like right away, was on Pitocin. Um, and yeah, just like very emotionally traumatized. Um, and in the end, it was over 40 hours, right? Your yeah, first? over 40 hours. And I had to push for like almost three hours. Um, 
And so when Willow is born, like she was fine, but like her APGAR scores were like not great. Um, she, you know, needed help like with resuscitation. So I didn't have very much like skin to skin contact um, when she was very like first born. Um, and yeah, it was just, I was exhausted. I was traumatized. I didn't get to like have the support that I really wanted and had, you know, wished for going into it. And so mm -hmm. that was like my big thing with um, when I got pregnant with Tilly was I wanted to have the support system and the support team um, that I really wanted for Willa's birth, but couldn't. And so again, I had my mom and my best friend, Mary, uh, in the delivery room with me. And I also this time decided that I really wanted a doula, um, especially for physical support. So without having a partner, um, I really wanted someone there who knew how to physically support me. Um, my Absolutely. mom and my best friend are both great, like emotional um, and like mental supports, but they both like have issues with their hands. And so I knew that the support I needed physically wouldn't necessarily be provided by them. Mm -hmm. Um which was really interesting because it was actually like one of those first things I really had to advocate because both my mom and my best friend were like, why do you need a doula? Um, you know, they kind of didn't see the benefit of it. And um, so I really had to like stand up for myself and be like, no, like I really want having, you know, to have the support um, of a doula. And so a big part of that was, yeah, like knowing different positions and having the expertise of all the different birthing positions. And I think that um, that also like comes out in like the birth prep yoga is just Absolutely. like all the different positions that are possible and how to do them. And um, so that's just something that I really wanted. So this time around, first you decided my birth is going to be different. Yeah. I want a better birthing experience. I deserve a better birthing experience Two, You knew that you needed the support. And so you got that doula and you did my course. So you knew how to move your body with birth prep yoga. You knew how to breathe. And then you had the doula that was physically there for you that could have the strength and knew exactly what's going on uh, in each stage of labor that you, what you needed. So you had your toolkit this time full, like yes. stacked. Yes. So tell exactly. us how it went. So this is just yeah. a few weeks ago. So there yeah. she is. So beautiful. So, so sweet. Oh, don't worry about moving her. She, we can see her perfectly. <laughs> no. She's so sweet. So you went into labor, you get into the hospital, you have your um, doula, your mom, your friend, and you, and then what, how did it happen? So yeah. you went in because you're used you, I remember you told me, you had to be induced, right? This time yeah, around? Yeah, so I had a planned induction. Um, I am going to be 40 uh, here in a couple months. So I'm of advanced maternal age. Um, and so the new recommendation is that you have an induction at 39 weeks. Um, and while it's something that I really discussed with my midwife, um, and like the really one off one thing that really pushed me towards going forward with the um, planned induction was that my midwife was going to be out of town um starting like my due date and that next week and again part of like having the support team that I really wanted was like having my midwife um be the one to um be at my delivery and not an OBGYN in the hospital she, so tell us, what only... is it like? What is it like, Sarah, to be induced? How does it feel? So it feels strange because like your body isn't necessarily prepared for birth. And so it feels a little bit different in terms of like trying to get your body where your mind is. 
because you go into the hospital thinking like okay I'm going to go have a baby but your body's just like not really ready Mm -hmm. it's just a normal day here (laughs) yeah it and it really did it felt pretty normal like my best friend picked me up and like we went to the hospital and there's like I had been having kind of like Braxton Hicks or you know like um just small kind of contractions that you know didn't bug me at all but like definitely felt a little bit of that of my body getting ready for birth Mm -hmm. um but I kind of felt like oh it's just a normal day it could be any day (laughs) you know and so yeah like having to have you know an IV and medicine um to really get labor started um just felt different you know I wasn't in pain going into the hospital like I was um with Willa um I had to kind of get both my mental and (laughs) my body like physically ready um for birth I guess so was your midwife there the whole time like did she come in with you or did you go in get the induction and then she came in hours later she was technically there but she it was a Thursday regular day and so she actually was seeing patients in her clinic which is right next door and so she was available if I needed her um but she wasn't really present that's really Um, great that you could you didn't have because sometimes women can feel pressure if their caregivers standing there and they're like why isn't my body doing anything so you had the space and you had the mental space to be like okay I'm just gonna let my body kind of get ready for this because I need to have this baby soon so you didn't have that pressure that's great so then what happened next did you once stuff started going yeah so I was started just like with Mesa Priestel and then also they um inserted like a balloon to help manually dilate my cervix so I started at um about three centimeters and so they didn't think it would take very long at all um and so yeah so I basically got like hooked up all to monitors and an IV and um basically just started like hanging out with my best friend and my mom came um a few hours later and we just kind of waited and talked and chatted and we really were having just kind of a nice time to like connect and not have our toddlers um interrupting our conversation uh which was kind of nice and um, both my friend and I, um, she has a four-year-old at Willis three now. Um, so having that space is kind of different. Um, and you, and you had like food and coffee and you're not yeah. like, cause so many women think when they're in labor, they shouldn't eat like a lot of healthcare providers say you shouldn't be eating. You're in labor. And I think it's so important to listen to your body. If you're hungry, eat like a lot of first time moms don't feel like eating, but if you do eat second time too, like I remember my first labor, I didn't eat at all. I just drank like lots of hydration. I think I had a few pieces of watermelon, but my second time I was like you, Sarah, like my second time I was eating, like I had a lot of food and then I gave birth right after. So I was so great. And then I ate again, like I was hungry after. So I think it's really just listening to your body and you had, you wanted to eat. So you did, and it gave you the fuel you needed to get through the induction and the waiting, the waiting time. Right. Yeah. And then then how many hours until things started to get going? Yeah. So I, we went to the hospital at seven 30. Um, I had lunch, had a big old like chicken sandwich and like, yeah yeah was eating normally and but like you said I did have to kind of advocate for myself because the nurses were like well if you get put on Pitocin like you're not going to be able to eat and I was like oh really and then my midwife who like was there was like oh no she can eat that's totally fine but you could just 
see like the big difference between like some of the like OBs at the hospital and like my midwife who like was also advocating for me saying oh no it's totally fine for her to eat while being on Pitocin Mm -hmm. um and so then uh my midwife was um asking if like what kind of steps I want to take next. Um, And she was, you know, offering to break my waters, um, you know, have me um, give me another dose of the oral medications. And it was at that point, kind of um, in the mid afternoon that I asked um, to start on Pitocin because I was pretty comfortable um the contractions weren't much worse uh than when I first came in uh I could feel them they were you know becoming consistent and normal um but I wasn't in any pain and so I kind of was like all right like let's keep this going but I did um ask that my waters not be broken um I really you know, I had done my research and I just like, I want to try and avoid, um, any, you know, infection risks. Um, and also I was just really trying to avoid C-sections so the less interventions kind of, um, mm-hmm. I was definitely looking to try and avoid certain things. Um, the main thing is that you felt you had choice. And she yeah. asked you, would you like this? And you said, not right now. Like, it's just not the right time. And so she gave you the space to wait. So then a few, how many more hours go by? Yeah. So it was probably like um, another two or three hours. So she finished uh, her work at, in the office and came back. So it was about five o'clock. Um, and Did they she up the asked- Pitocin? Did they up the dose? Yep. So yeah. every 30 minutes it was upped. Okay. Um, and that's through IV? Mm-hmm. And then do they also give you something orally too? No. So it, the oral medicine was just at the very beginning. In the okay. Morning. So they're upping it, upping it. By this time, what about the balloon that's widening your cervix? What's yes. that doing? So event, um, So when they start Pitocin, is when they gave it a little tug and it came right out. Um, so I didn't have to have the balloon anymore, which was like actually kind of really uncomfortable for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was happy to get that taken out. Um, and so, yeah, so it's probably like, I don't know, about five centimeters uh, when that came out. And I just really was, into like using the birthing ball, you know, sitting, moving, walking around the hallways. Again, something very different than when Willow was born with COVID. I wasn't allowed to leave my room, let alone the bed. Um, so and that, just being that able to is, walk around. That's the number one thing in birth prep yoga. It's movement. You got to move your body. You got to shift around, let gravity do its thing you know, shift and move and allow your baby to do her thing as she's moving down, right? As your cervix is widening. So I love that you did. I love that you were moving around the room instinctively. Yeah. So that's right. Right about when, um, when I got the Pitocin is when I called my doula and said, Hey, you know, like they're starting Pitocin. It'd probably be good for you to like, you know, head to the hospital when you can. And so she came uh, fairly soon after I started Pitocin and like she really helped me advocate for that movement because when they started me on Pitocin that's when they like required right or said it's policy that um, you be on continuous monitoring and so they were having trouble like keeping the Tilly like on the monitors And so at first I kind of felt like I had to like be in bed holding still, you know, so that the monitors would work. Um, But my doula really helped me like think about the fact that 
like they can require me to wear the monitors, but they can't require me to like stay in bed and like be perfectly still. And that the birth that I want required movement and being up and about. And so it was like just this big mental shift for me mm-hmm. of saying like, yes, I'm going to follow hollow hospital policy and have the monitors on but I'm not going to allow um that policy to dictate how I um you know can move and deal with you know contractions and get my body ready uh to have this baby and so that was just like a big mental shift um And it didn't require me to like, you know, you know, like advocate necessarily with the nurses, but just have that shift of mind of, okay, like, yes, you can monitor, but I'm going to move. And so you might have to come in and like, you know, change where the placement of the monitors or whatever. Um, But they didn't mind and I didn't mind and we just kind of work together um to allow Mm -hmm. that to happen um but yeah and I got to do like some really great um positional changes like inversions with my doula who is well versed she did lots of um like rebozo like jiggling um and just like felt so good on my body and like that was like the big thing is my body just felt really great throughout this process. Um, and so your body felt really great in this process. How different is that than Willa? Your body <laughs> didn't feel great. Completely body- different. I literally felt like my body was breaking with Willa. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was with um, an epidural. That was with, you know, my mom and um everyone doing like counter pressure and things like that that just weren't helping um I had narcotics with Willa I think both uh morphine and fentanyl um to try and control that pain and it just like nothing was really working um Mm -hmm. yeah and so this felt completely different where I was up I was moving I um you know really was listening to my body Mm -hmm. uh, like this position feels good or I want to try something different or um yeah yeah and but it also kind of allowed me you know to like make those decisions then at like when it was five o'clock and my midwife was back and she was asking you know, what I want to do next. And I said, I think I'm ready to have my waters broken. Um, you know, I had been on oral medications for about four hours on Pitocin for another three or four hours. And I was just ready, um, for like kind of the next step and Mm -hmm. for my body, um, to feel those like more intense, kind of contractions and things like that and so that's when you, did you get life... back on the bed lay down she broke it yep she broke then, it did but you then get I back, got up, back right? up okay I got right back up um and so as soon as the my waters were broken I was back up moving again um doing a lot of standing positions um and I felt an immediate change in my body of kind of those relaxed contractions where you know I didn't have to really breathe through them much to like immediately having to like really concentrate on um breathing through the contractions um so then what else did you use in your room to help you give birth did you use like what were your comfort items in the room yeah so I used the bed a lot I just raised it up um, pretty much as high as it would go. And I just would stand up when I wasn't having a contraction. And then when I would, I would just use it to rest my upper body 
and allow kind of my lower body to be free. And like, I was doing a lot of like hip swings and um, figure eights. I used the birthing ball a little bit. Um, and then really it was using my doula and um, like my mom and my friend Mary to really, yeah, do some counter pressure to just rub my back um my doula had a fan and I get really hot really easily and so they were like fanning me um you know that's funny I hear from some moms that the fan was the best thing that their doula or they had in their hospital bed because it was hot and they were hot and just having that cool air was so soothing so like what an interesting thing to think you need it was like a fan like how yeah. And I that would say really helped, number right? one on my hospital list is have a fan. <laughs> I'm writing down these notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it actually went really quickly from that time. Um, so I would say that like within 20 minutes, I felt um, like that, like I was in labor that I probably was fully dilated um, so when my waters were broken, I was at seven centimeters. So within 20, 30 minutes, I probably went from seven to 10. Um, yeah. Do you think you were, do you think this whole time you were a little bit obsessed about the centimeters or were you kind of just in it? You were just, yeah, I was just kind of in it. Like I didn't cause... really care. Yeah, I just because was like, so okay, many moms, like, that's nice to know. So many moms are so attached to the numbers. And, and it can be really disheartening when you are hours into it. And then your doctor tells you you're only four centimeters. Like, it's like the news just drops, like drops your energy, drops your stamina, drop everything. So I always tell moms, like, it's just a number. Don't yep. let it don't let it like crush your bubble of, of like energy of your, what you, your preserves of your will and that. So I love that you, you weren't attached to those numbers. You were just, they were just information, right? Yeah. Okay. So you, you now knew you, did you instinctively know you had to birth her now on the bed or where did you want to birth her? Yeah. So I like, at this point, my legs were starting to get like the shakes. The shake. mm -hmm. And so I just knew that like my legs probably weren't going to be strong enough to really hold me up for the birth. Um, and so I asked if I could get on the bed. And also this was when I was thinking in my head, like, I should probably get an epidural, right? Like, I don't, you know, the 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 pain is coming and I like could kind of know that in my head and so I was like I asked for an epidural knowing it was going to take some time to get the anesthesiologist and everyone set up and but I was just still like able to like breathe through the contractions and it was too late to try and get like a shot of morphine or anything like that it was too late um but the nurse was working on getting the anesthesiologist for an epidural. Um, but probably within like 10 minutes of asking for the epidural, I could feel my body um, starting to like bear down on its own, like on its own, like that feeling of needing to push. Um, and so that's when I got like on the bed, but I laid on my side Um because yeah it wasn't comfortable to be on my back at all yes um, that's I the just, thing like, and I barely was on the bed like I because I was already yeah starting to like push and so and I love that you felt that this is not comfortable some women birth great on their backs yeah pulling their legs up for that squat position but you know it's not for everyone and so that you realized oh my gosh, the last thing I want to do is lay on my back right now. So you were barely on the bed. And then what did you do? Yeah, so I just laid on my side. Um, and 
by that time, yeah, I was starting to push already just instinctively. And that's another thing that I really wanted to have different is I felt like I had been coached to start pushing with Willa before I was ready. Like I didn't mm-hmm. have any um, like instinct to start pushing. They said, oh, like you're 10 centimeters, you should start pushing. And so this time was so different because my body was the one who was telling me, okay, it's time to push with this contraction. We're going like bear down and push. And so, you know, I actually felt, you know, like I had a bowel movement. Um, I started, you know, like I vomited, like I just like my body um, was was doing expelling all that. expelling everything. Yeah. Expelling Very everything. common. Yeah. Yes. And so, um, yeah, at that time, uh, the nurse kind of noticed and was like, hey, you know, like, you might want to stop pushing so that your midwife can get here. And I was like, well, I can't. Uh, I have to push. Um, But, you know, I did try and, like, do some more breathing um, to try and just, like, relax as much as possible um between contractions but also during contractions and so my midwife did make it um but (laughs) it was great um but yeah they just like held um my mom held held your leg leg up right they held your leg up yeah so just so mom's listening to this sarah moving on her side made her birth instinctively slow down because when you are standing, gravity helps, helps. And that's why the whole time when she was standing, it got things going, it got her to that 10 centimeters. But when she rolled on her side, she slowed it down, which was a good thing because if she was standing with her legs shaking like that, her baby just would have flew out of her and she would have had to catch her. So she knew, come on my side. I, if you go on your side or all fours on your knees, you slow down birth. So she did that instinctively. And then her body was, Like she said, the first time she was told to push, her second time, her body was pushing without her having to be coached. Like she just knew, like, I got to breathe and slow this down. This is very common with second time or third time moms because her body's done this before. So she's doing things to slow it down, which is really cool, Sarah, that you just instinctively did that because you knew about how to move your body, the different positions, right? we do that in the course too but you you so that you knew it when you were in that room to try all these different things so that worked um and so so that you know vomiting having bowel movements very common so everything's out of the way so baby can come and so now you are being you have your midwife there you're you're and then what happens and then so yeah so they just take like the bottom of the bed kind of away and my midwife is there lots of and your legs being held up yeah because that opening like her holding her leg up is impossible so someone has to hold that top leg up or a peanut ball has to be there because she is fatigued so just remember that that pelvic opening can't close it has to be opened so someone's holding that up cool that the bed can be removed so the midwife is right there that's awesome and then yeah and then it I probably pushed about four times uh, until he was here. So cool. Uh, yeah, just so different. Um, and then she gets placed on your chest right yes, away? Right away. So cool. So then I do. I They flip me on my back so that I can, like, lay down and also relax my legs. Um, and also... Uh, I did have like a second degree tear because it was pretty quick. Fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So my body didn't have time to like fully stretch uh, by itself. Um, so my midwife was then working to repair that second degree tear. But yeah, I just got to have uh, Tilly right on my chest. Um, and she was like wide awake, vibrant. Um, she had an APGOR score of nine right off the bat, which is, you know, nine out of 10. Um, 
which is I don't know like for Willa was like I think probably like a four or five um so just like very different um in terms of um how awake Tilly really was and so she was an alert and yeah alert. so she was she... like searching for the breast right away uh -huh. um and I think that my kind of like advocating for myself and um having my doula and everything like this is where I would say like I wish I would have advocated even more for myself because at it was at this point where I had my IV in on one arm and a blood pressure cuff on the other and I felt a little bit tied down to the bed mm -hmm. um so like I was trying to like hold my baby and you know encourage um like breastfeeding right away like seeing if she would latch um and I just felt a little bit tied down to the bed because of like because the the, the, the hospital team every is doing minutes. yeah the hospital team is like okay babies that we got to we got to be on our job um instead of you giving giving you space giving that golden hour we've been talking about that golden hour where you don't feel restrained and you can if if you're healthy and everything's gone r r great why not give you that time to hold her without restraint without that constant blood pressure thing squeezing and being very painful for your arm uh, when you're just trying to hold her so i think it's really important for moms to know how you want your first moments to be with your baby that protecting that time if if like like this i want skin to skin contact i want to have as much time before doing all the checks like i want to have if my baby scored the nine out of ten i want to like it's okay to to give us a bit of space even like 15 minutes you know like 20 minutes um yeah i remember with my my second i was so used to them pulling your baby away and looking at them at their i was like trying to hand my baby to them and my midwives were like no no hannah pull her in it's okay she's she's healthy just keep her on you and when babies are on their moms they feel like they're in a safe and um recognizable environment they know you they know your smell they know your heartbeat and so for me holding her that hour of her like clearing because my baby came out so fast that she had a lot of fluids so she was just coughing it up on me instead of in a stranger's arm so it, it just made a lot of sense but me automatically just was trying to like hand her away um because we're used to that we're used to seeing yeah. that that right away babies are snatched away from their moms while every all the things are done to them when uh when a baby is healthy it's okay to give them time to be like okay here's my person <laughs> you know i'm in a good that's place where my doula really helped me like because i was now in pain um you know to like she really was able to, like vocalize the fact that like i wanted um to like do all the like stimulation or like wiping of Tilly myself and in fact I didn't really want her wiped off much at all anyways like I mm -hmm. like you know the idea of like the vernix being a protector of our babies yes, absolutely and just like not needing to be wiped off right away and so you know we did the like cord clamping um ask that the nurses not wipe the baby off um and so my doula like kind of stepped in and said hey you know like Sarah doesn't want her baby wiped off you know and so the nurses kind of like looked at her you know like okay you know but I like you know they're like oh we're just like stimulating you know and my doula was like no Sarah's going to do it herself you know and <laughs> good for you yeah so that was really nice um to have that how did that make you feel like inside were you like yes <laughs> yeah I was like someone has my back you know like they yeah. know my plan they know what 
Um, Because you yourself, you're tired. You can't voice that out right there. You can't, you would just lay back exhausted watching a nurse wipe off your baby while you didn't want that to happen. Yeah. Right. And so inside, you know exactly what's going on, but you're too tired to vocalize it. But then you can have that feeling of triumph and empowerment that, yes, this is what I want. And it's happening right now. Like, I think similar to like what you were saying is like, because I felt tied down because I was like in pain, getting stitched up. And then um, they were doing very intense, like, bundle massage of my uterus um that was very painful and distracting and like took my breath away every time that they did it and it was about probably every 10 to 15 minutes they were massaging uh, my belly um and so I just felt like I wasn't able to really connect with Tilly during that time and so I actually was like if you're going to take her you might as well take her now when I'm like can't feel like I can connect with her um Mm -hmm. and so they did they like took her and like um I like opted for you know some the vaccinations and things like that some from in the um, medicine and did the weight checks and all those things um but then if you could go back would that be the one thing you changed is that that our first is not so disturbed yeah I would have um probably really advocated for not doing bundle massage especially since I was on Pitocin and there's not good evidence that um you actually need to have the bundle massage um you know they have to check and do some assessments but the like really intense bundle massage isn't actually um a requirement or evidence-based uh you know a necessity to prevent hemorrhage um so I think that's one thing that I would have really advocated for was um to at least do less uh fundal massage to uh you know if the blood pressure cuff was bothering me just saying I don't want my blood pressure checked anymore um and yeah to really just protect that golden hour um Mm -hmm. you know I'm gonna write that down because that's that's such a good point protect that golden hour because like I didn't even realize um how many moms that's taken away from uh because I had like with my doulas, like every time I tried to hand my baby away, they said, no, no, keep her to you. So I had her on me the whole time. And I was in my own bed while they were doing everything. Honestly, I was just staring at her. I didn't even know they did the blood pressure and all that, but I felt so undisturbed, you know, like I remember the massaging of my belly and I remember it was just, it wasn't comfortable, but they were, they kind of waited. They were there for like four hours after the birth that time felt like nothing. So yeah, it, it goes like, very quickly. It goes very quickly. But I remember just having so much time with her. Mm-hmm. And maybe they did give me that space. I don't know the the one hour, four hours, five hours kind of fades into really fast after the baby's here, but just having protecting that golden hour and then do all the things, you know, yeah. then do the blood pressure, then do the intense fundal massage if that's what needed, you know, like, right. But why right away start going at you when you just have your baby in your arms and you're, you know, it's like, come on. (laughs) But they have their protocols too. So I love that, that you had that, that realization going back and that you had such a different birth story. So if you could give anyone advice who's watched our, your beautiful entire stories, Sarah, what would you say? would you give advice to a first or second time mom about like three tips for them your top three tips yeah so i would say definitely have a birth plan and share it with all of your support people whoever you choose uh to have there even if it's just like your midwife or your ob but just really share that plan so that they know ahead of time 
um, what you're hoping for. Um, Cause like things change, whatever, but if they know what that ideal is, then you can work towards that, whatever mm -hmm. comes about. Um, my second is to like, really think about how you want af the afterbirth, right? So not just like, do you want epidural or no epidural? Like, um, but really think about like, okay, like, do I want, you know, lidocaine for the stitches that probably are going to come? Do I want, um, you know, certain people to hold the baby or not hold the baby? Um, yeah, okay. just like, how do you want that golden hour to be? Um, I remember with Willa, I, there was a lot of like, um, of the nurses, like trying to help with the latch um, for breastfeeding. And I found it really like overwhelming to have mm -hmm. someone like forcing my baby like onto my breast and um, like not having that information about like how, like practicing, I guess, like how to hold the baby and your breast and get a latch and all those things was really overwhelming to me with Willa. Um, but I was lucky that I just like kind of stuck with it and we ended up breastfeeding for over two years, wow. uh, Willa and I, and then, so with Tilly, I kind of asked, I was like, the asked the nurses to be hands off and to like not help me. Um, you know, and one of the nurses was like, oh, like you want to do like cross cradle hold. And I was like, no, I actually really prefer to do like a laying back hold where like using gravity to hold the baby to me, to my chest instead of like my physically hands trying to manipulate. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, like that was another big thing was just. And how like, is she breastfeeding now? great yeah yeah we have I haven't had any issues um other than you know some soreness or things like that and you know with each baby like we're both kind of learning each other and mm -hmm. it just takes about a week or two weeks to kind of figure everything out um, so it sounds like you went from a birth that felt very scary and very traumatizing to a, a very empowering experience the yeah. second time and, and like you said you know yourself you know your body it's all like I really just like say for first-time moms like your body is going to be speaking to you and mm -hmm. like just to like be really open to listening to your body Ooh, that's a great third point point your body is going and write this down yeah. to be speaking to you say what you said after that again yeah and you just have to be open to listening mm -hmm. to your body that's a great third point yeah listening to it yeah that's great thank you so much sarah like yeah no incredible. thank you hannah like honestly like just knowing you and like being a part of, you know, your mommy and baby yoga, you know, with Willa, just to like really get in touch with your body. And um, yeah, I just really appreciated like your birth prep yoga to like really help remind me about like how important that conversation between, you know, me and my body is and like yes. my baby and um, just being really, um, empowered to advocate for myself um and to have the support team I needed to advocate for myself and the birth that I wanted um, awesome thank yeah. you so much I